Season 2, Bonus Episode 1. Welcome to the Baseline Feed Podcast. My name is Tanner Wood, and I'll be your host once again. This is the first bonus episode of the season, and seriously, your support means the world to us. We must thank you all for your continued support. Are you a producer, writer, or a voice actor? We could work with you. Get more information at BaselineFeed.com, or send a voice demo to casting at BaselineFeed.com. Here we are presenting the story of Kiri, a girl with special abilities who will undergo a grueling challenge to prove her worth in a world where everything has to be fought for. This challenge could save her from a life of misery. Can she succeed? That's up to you to discover in a story brought to you by Harley Easton with the voices of Rebecca Mersinger, Katie Tatry, Harley Easton, TJ Hodder, and myself, Tanner Wood. On behalf of the Baseline Feed team, we hope you enjoy Music is Blood Memory. Kiri's hands shook slightly as she removed the adornments from her wrists and tightened the silk robe around her muscular frame. Over the past few days, the attendants had taken the other artists, one by one, to the performance hall. Hemmerk, the first to be called, had prepared a percussive dance piece from his home city of Zavala. Nanikin, the willowy beauty from the East Isles, had gone next. She had chosen to represent the farthest of the Eastern cultures with an atonal selection from the Great Wars. Godric, the childlike ancient from the frozen mountains in the north, had performed a folk lament from the ice caves of Davar. Kiri, born at the edge of the Western Sea, was the last of the four chosen this year, and the only one with a composition of her own. It was a great risk. The center assembly demanded fair representation from each region, and it was well known that they preferred pieces of cultural significance. If they did not like her composition, they would let her die from her wounds. Her body would be sent to the incinerators, her song silenced forever. Seven years of training in the Artist Academy, painful years of endurance and suffering, would all be for nothing. The Center City Treaties demanded sacrifice. Cultural heritage had to be salvaged in a society that no longer allowed individual regions to govern themselves in manners as slight as dress code. The best from each culture were presented at the annual Center Assembly. For such an event, the Centers collected children each year from the four regions and trained them as politicians, artists, makers, teachers, healers, or clerics. Those not sent to the bustling metropolis remained in agricultural or mining industries in their respective regions. Goods were sent to support the city along with the children. It was the price the regions paid to be represented, for the select few to receive an education. The unification of all peoples and cultures in the city was dictated after the global wars ended, long before Kiri's grandparents, grandparents, grandparents were ever born. Kiri remembered the ship that brought her to the center. Steam and steel were oddities to a child used to open fire cooking and hammock bedding. The healer had cooed over Kiri's dark skin, hazel eyes, and bronze braided hair, distinct indicators of a child from the western wilds. Detester had been less kind, but helpful in his way, 
He'd grasped her hand, turning it efficiently to puncture her skin with his silver finger armor as she watched him do with the others before her. She'd been told to expect the cutting during the ritual, but had not been prepared for the roughness of his tongue as the tip slid across her reddened finger. The tester's eyes flashed as he regarded her. Artist. When she stepped into the city for the first time, Kiri'd fought to breathe through the black fog that cloaked the center. There was little time to miss her homeland or worry over the loss of the cool, mist-filled air as the transporters had ushered her and the other children into a square building. Most of her companions had kept their heads bowed, but she gawked at the glass and steel structure that stretched higher than she could see. Having little care for the emotions of their cargo, the transporters rushed her and the other youngsters along to be deposited in what she now knew as the assembly hall, where they were sorted into trades and sent to their instructors. Even with the choking fog constricting her chest, it was the least painful experience she'd have in the next seven years. The three years of basic artist curriculum demanded extreme focus and dedication. As a musician, Kiri had become well acquainted with pain, the stabbing sensation that came when the blood pooled on her skin from the instrument she was trained to use, and the searing feeling when the healers wiped clean her skin and sent her back to the teachers. The artists that didn't make it through the pain became unnamed. They were condemned to perform low-level functions within the city until the labor killed them. Which would happen in a few short years. With the basic curriculum completed, Kiri moved on to work with the mentors. The step marked the first time in Academy that she had a choice in who would teach her and what she selected to learn. From the start of the fourth year, lessons became about endurance. Kiri discovered methods of coping with the discomfort of deeper cuts long enough for her life source to blend properly in the ceremonial bowls with another's. Breathing and meditation skills were necessary to ignore the sting. Sharp eyes and ears kept music flowing seamlessly for the audience. Different depths of cuts, varied lengths of marks, or unusual locations on her skin would change cadence or dynamic in the subtlest of ways. Discomfort must not interfere with tempo. Chord resolution could not fail due to loss of consciousness. The bodily strain of training was intense, and every accomplished musician looked older than their years. Kiri was talented, though. Unusually so. The tester had chosen her field of study well. Both of her mentors, Padriac and Yana, had declared her a worthy student, and each had offered her a vial before she left their tutelage. Holding the vials, she waited for the attendant. The green one was from Padriac, a master from the north with the sweet, sorrowful dirges and passionate reels of a long-dead people flowing through his veins. The fuchsia vial was from Yana, whose heart pulsed the beat of a hundred tribal rhythms. To hold two vials so early in her studies was an honor, and to have been chosen in the bloodletting without opening either was also unheard of. Kiri shouldn't have been presented for the ceremony this young. She wouldn't have if Mentor Yana hadn't offered her name to the assembly. Other musicians spent decades perfecting their song for presentation. Only in her seventh year of study and her first year as a solo artist, it was almost laughable that she stood in line with the others for selection. Each year, an assembly jury selected the musicians. It was forbidden to heal the wounds of those who have failed and many in line before Kiri had displayed scars. To hide from the clerics or the jury was to be cast from the center into the Deadlands, created by radiation from the wars. Better to live with the wounds than risk certain death by starvation and the slow creep of insanity. Kiri had been the twelfth student presented. She had done as mentor Yana instructed, kneeling on the pillow in the center of the small room, 
presenting her back to the assembly jury and offering her outstretched hands to the priestesses. The holy woman had raised an eyebrow at Kiri's youth and her unscarred palms. Both were proof of her first ceremony. Still, there could be no claim of bias. Clerics that presided over the music ceremony were deafened the year that they chose their focus. An acolyte had presented the deaf holy women with a cup and two knives. They'd passed the cup between them, ceremonially taking a sip of clear water to cleanse their palates. Simultaneously, they had stabbed Kiri's palms with the ritual knives, releasing a cacophony of sounds that reverberated through the acoustically perfect space as they lathed their tongues against her bloodied skin. Kiri had trembled, unprepared, when both women stilled. The West has chosen. The jury had nodded acceptance. That had been a month ago. After the bloodletting, Kiri and the other three artists had been secluded, placed on a floor of the building reserved for preparation for the assembly. Each assembly lasted four days, with the jury reviewing the progress of students in the various fields of study, determining who was a productive member of society and who was a corpse. Kiri had never been invited to an assembly before, only city inhabitants who had passed the trial were allowed in attendance. For the last several weeks, clerics had passed all of the artists through the cleansing rituals, stretching exercises, and specialized diets to purify their vital fluids for the best possible performance. The assembly ended each night with a musician's offering. They are ready. The attendant led her to the stage of the assembly hall, the massive room she had not seen in seven years. From the farthest edge of the wooden stage, Kiri assessed the audience. It was the final day of the assembly and every chair was occupied. The hum of hundreds of conversations filled the space. The five members of the jury sat at a raised table in the audience, each with one clear glass of water and one ceremonial goblet before them. Kiri bowed to her judges. In return, each raised their glass of water in toast and drank to show their judgment would be pure. A gesture from one of the five gave her leave to proceed with the performance. She reached the center stage and the audience hushed. Kiri removed her silken robe wearing all but her breasts and sex those being bound with white ceremonial cloth. She ran her fingers over the handles of the sharp silvery instruments before her, selecting a spring-loaded lancet. She then surveyed the pewter bowls. The concentric rings inside each would let her know how much she had bled, how much more of her life could be dedicated to this composition. Looking up, Kiri displayed her mentor's vials to the audience before uncorking them. Three red drops fell from Pedric's vial and three from Yana's. Rather than drinking, she let the blood slip under her tongue to be absorbed by her lingual veins. Most artists used the vials before they arrived on stage to ensure effectiveness. Kiri had specifically waited to give her mentor's blood the most potency. When she felt the thrum of music in her veins, she knew it was time to begin. There was a moment when she hesitated, paused to breathe, but not to contemplate failure. Then it began. The lancet stabbed deeply into her left arm near the elbow, releasing a stream of hot red fluid as she punctured the cephalic vein. Instantly, the sound of waves shushed through the auditorium, along with a series of solid thumps. The ethereal keening of an ancient string instrument soon followed as Kiri quickly pulled a three-pronged fleam from the table and dragged it to attack the vessels hiding just under her forearm. 
Burning liquid dripped from the wounds, merged down her arm, and fell as one solid stream into the bowl on the farthest left of the table, filling it to the third circle imprinted on the pewter. Switching to a thin needle, Kiri gently pricked each of the fingers on her right hand. The drops fell separately into the same bowl, each red tear imitating the sweet voice of a child. Continuing to let her arms seep blood into the bowl, Kiri licked the wounds on her fingers, silencing the children's voices before picking up a scalpel. She made a deep slash across her right cheek. An anguished female howl circled the room as Kiri pulled her thumb across the cut and rimmed the pewter bowl with crimson. These were sounds of her village as she remembered it best. This was the song of the sea as it lathed against her people, the waves that assaulted the small wooden crafts as they went out into the storms. Children cried and women wailed as, for centuries, they lost their loved ones. These were unsung cries of drowned sailors and the tears shed over the flaming vessels that took warriors to their rest. Repeated loss was the anguish and the strength of the Western people. Kiri smoothed the red lines on her left arm, leaving only the pounding and the shushing of waves to fill the auditorium as she began the second movement of the piece. She reached for another fleam, a four-pronged one this time, with wicked shining points. She stabbed the blades into her chest hard, three times, and a warm sound spilled out with her blood, which she captured in a chalice. The bright, sonorous tone was soon aided by the rhythmic jig of a reedy instrument as Kiri used the same fleam to create more shallow wounds along the tops of each of her feet. She spared half of a heartbeat to thank Padriac for this influence as the attendant fluttered around her, capturing the flow, expertly covering each foot with a porous cloth which he squeezed out into the middle bowl. Kiri's head was feeling light as she removed a long-handled, double-bladed knife and slid the steel into her stomach just under the ribs. Hot liquid spurted from her wound and into the middle bowl, bringing forth a brassy chorus of deep, rich notes rippling harmonically. It was a mortal wound if left, but the only way to achieve such sound. This chant was the sun that danced over the ocean as the children played on one of the good days. It was pulling the nets from the ocean to find enough food to feed a village, sharing laughter with neighbors and friends, joining in the merriment of summer festivals and the warmth of winters by the hearth. These were the rare times, but the ones that kept them by the fickle Western Sea. The second movement of this song reflected the joys of still being wild, connected to the water and ways that were lost to the city. Kiri was getting weak. Breathing was hard. Nonetheless, she pressed on and steeled herself. The third movement was the most difficult. The strain of complete control, supporting a tone at a volume of mere silence when her body was racked with pain was a challenge. But Kiri had refused to compose this piece without the third face of the sea. Again, she pressed the lancet at the crook of her elbow, opening the wound further so the sound of the waves would remain smooth as the blood flowed without restriction. Her knees weakened and her vision blurred, but it didn't matter. Only one cut was left. Using the already reddened knife, Kiri made a smooth incision along her jugular. The attendant caught her body before it fell to the floor and leaned her over the third pewter bowl. With the stomach wound, Kiri had barely enough left to fill the container to the second ring. The audience strained to hear the whispered melody of a mother's lullaby, sung sweet and low. This hymn was the release of sorrows, the joy of a peaceful sleep. It was the rocking of the waves as the moon pulled them to and fro, the slow waltz wrapped around couples locked in each other's embrace. This was the calm that graced a village when there were no storms. 
The waves knew there was a simple balance, an awareness at the end of a cycle. The attendant slowly laid Kiri upon the floor as the piece faded into silence. Each of the three bowls was poured into a crystal pitcher while her head lolled back. She trembled, both from pain and the intense cold feeling her body. The attendant's weight made the wooden stairs creak as he ascended to the judge's table. It was the only sound in the now eerily silent room. Struggling to remain conscious, Kiri waited in anticipation, unable to see into the audience anymore. She noted the clink of goblets and knew each judge would drink deep of her blood, her song, to decide if what they heard was truly embedded in her veins, if it kept the true heritage of the westernmost people despite its newness. In her half-delusional state, Kiri wondered if she truly heard the judges swallow her life essence, or if the thudding in her ears was the slowing of her own system. The shuffling of cloth and the slap of a single person clapping was followed by six sets of hands lifting her. More joined in the chorus until the entire audience applauded as one massive heartbeat. Kiri felt herself growing warmer, pinpricks of searing pain dancing along her skin as the healers went to work on her ravaged body. She sighed in relief. Triumph. Kiri was now a mentor. The healers would cover her wounds, wash the gore from her body, and offer her dreamless sleep. Over the next few weeks, there would be feasts in celebration of those who survived the assembly. After each, they would bleed her near to death, pulling the music from her veins to be sent in vials to the four regions. When the celebrations were done, they would place her in suspended animation, and she would be awoken only to be bled for her song, or to teach another hopeful. Perhaps the healers would place her between Padriac and Yana in the mentor chambers so that they could learn of their student's accomplishment the next time they woke. Already, Kiri yearned to give a vial of her own to a student, offering them the use of her talent. She heard the healers discussing her performance and her wounds as if from far away, but their words wash over her and drain away uncomprehended. The blood, the music, the memory. They were her life and they had proven her worth. The warmth that filled her chest had nothing to do with the magic of those surrounding her. Kiri smiled and exhausted, gave herself over to sleep at last. That was quite a special ability. Once again, thank you to Harley Easton for this challenging story, and let's highlight our voice talent. Rebecca Mersinger is the narrator, Katie Tatry is the high priestess, Harley Easton is Kiri, TJ Hodder is the attendant, and myself, Tanner Wood, as the tester. The sound design was by Tanner Wood and C.M. Peters. Episode artwork by C.M. Peters. And music arrangements by Arthur Unk. We would like to express our eternal love and gratitude to our patrons. Among them, our newest, Tori Miller. You guys help make it possible to bring you quality content and our authors and voice talent more exposure. If you would also like our eternal love and gratitude, along with other goodies, check us out on Patreon. You can find the link to it on our website, BaselineFeed.com. One last reminder, you can join us on Discord for more behind-the-scenes stuff. Thank you for joining us, and make sure to tune in every other Saturday on your favorite podcast app to listen to a new episode of Baseline Feed. <laughs>